We are in the book of James. The last time we were in the book of James was back in 2008. Amen. It's time. All right. To revisit James. We'll start here, of course, in chapter 1. And let's begin, get right into the word, uh, uh, going through it in, exposit in, in, in an expository manner. Line upon line, precept upon precept. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a bondservant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. It's the way James opens his letter. The book of James is written to the dispersion, the descendants of the twelve tribes of Israel that were dispersed through the Assyrian and Babylonian captivity centuries before James has written his letter here. And so thus his audience was primarily, but not exclusively, Jewish. This word is for every believer. And it's a timely word, because as it's been said, we are either coming out of, in the midst of, or going into a trial. One thing that we all have in common is trials. And hence the title of the message, Trials of Joy. James talks about how we can have joy through our trials. And James here, of course, is the half-brother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he refers to himself as a bondservant of his half-brother, Jesus. Now, I say half-brother because Jesus' father was God, is God, and James' father was Joseph. And, uh, but it's amazing here, don't overlook it, that he says, James, a bondservant, of God and of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ, a bondservant. You know, it's nothing short of miraculous to me because, as many of you know, uh, the most difficult people to ever witness to are your siblings. Amen? Come on. And uh, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, his brothers didn't believe in him, uh, didn't believe in his, his statement that he was the Messiah. John chapter 7, verse 5, the Bible tells us there, for even his brothers, his half-brothers, that is, did not believe in him. And it's hard when you think about it for your siblings to believe in you because they grew up with you. Amen. You've tried to share with them, they're looking at you kind of funny. Because they know you. <laughs> and they wonder if you're going through a little phase or what have you. I know years ago I shared this story, but, you know, it was, I'm the oldest of uh, three boys in our family. And uh, the two youngest ones, I used to play a lot of tricks and do bad stuff to them. And... Uh, Brother next to me, uh, one day I talked him into, we were little kids, talked him into eating easy off oven cleaner. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, I took a little taste of it, kind of tastes pretty good, but I gave him a big spoonful, and I was just being generous, amen. And so we were eating easy off oven cleaner, and mom caught us, rushed us to the hospital. They gave us a combination of milk mixed with, uh, I think it was cod liver oil, to expel, amen, the... Uh, Easy off, oven cleaner. So when I go to him and I'm sharing with him about the Lord, he's like, now, I don't, let me see, let me get this. You uh, <laughs> talked me into easy off one time. I don't know if we don't, I want to believe what you're saying. Amen. So our, our siblings, it's a little hard to win them over because they know us. Yet Jesus lived with his brothers. He lived the perfect life, a sinless life. And yet his brothers still struggled with his claim to be the Messiah. But here James declares himself to be a willing slave of his half-brother, Jesus Christ. What happened? What convinced him? You know, the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus, an empty tomb. Amen? And I thought about that in relationship to us as, as believers, in relationship to our siblings. How are they going to believe us unless they witness a resurrected life in Jesus Christ? Amen? We, we can't be the same old person because you know, they, they know us. But when they begin to see a resurrected life in Christ, you're living by the power of God. Someone who is experiencing supernatural joy, even though they're going through a trial, they begin to believe in the hope that we have through faith in Christ. Amen? And so the same thing applies. A resurrected life, convince James, and a resurrected, res resurrected life, I'll get it out, will convince our siblings and those around us as well. So in verses 2 to 8, we're going to talk about, again, the Main theme is going through trials with joy. Something that we're all going to experience at one time or another. 
And in verses 2 to 8, we find four steps to overcoming the trials of life without losing our joy. And this, this radical, this is a radical thought, really, you know, that James is going to present here. This radical thought, if you will, uh, approach, rather, to Christian living is not only a witness to others, but is also a means by which we begin, we become mature in Christ. So this is the pathway to maturity in the Lord as well as being a witness to those who are around us. So what are the steps, the four steps? The number one step that I want to share with you is, number one, James says, count it. Counting. In verse 2, he says, my brethren, count it, what? All joy when you fall into various trials. Uh, Joy is not what naturally comes to my mind when I think of falling into trials. (laughs) And joy and trials is often not in the same sentence. But what I want you to understand here is that the Bible says, and I'm not saying that we should rejoice over people's accidents and their tragedies and all that, and say, oh, you had a tragedy, isn't that wonderful? I'll send you a card. You know, <laughs> it's not that. Because the Bible says, give thanks in all things, not for all things. Are you with me? So I want to make that point clear right up front. But all of us do go through trials, amen. And trials by nature are various. They're numerous. When he says various trials, it means numerous trials. No one just has one trial. Uh, they uh, accompany us throughout life itself. And, you know, we, we, we cannot be rid of them. I don't know if anybody come along and I've never met anyone and said, hey, you know, I got, I got rid of trials in my life, you know. And, uh, you know, that, that's never happened. We're all going to have trials in one form or another. They are various. They are many. And so what does James say we should do with our trials? We all have them in common. You know, we cannot be rid of them until we leave this planet. He says, rather than curse them, count them. Count them what? Count it all joy. Every trial, all joy. And what does that mean? Uh, some, something we, we uh, should note here, and that is James is not writing to the middle class or upper middle class believers in the dispersion. Or scattered abroad in the Middle East. Um, he's writing to believers who are wrestling with being poor. And they're struggling with economic challenges. They're in poverty and they are wrestling with oppression. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, evidenced by chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, we'll get into next time. And then chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, talks about the fact that these believers were struggling with poverty. They were struggling with oppression. And I know there's teaching going around today saying, oh, you know, if you're a believer, you should be, you know, you should be rich. And uh, every believer is supposed to be rich. Uh, that's not what I find in Scripture. And be careful at that type of teaching because what you want to do is you want to consider the whole counsel of God's Word. Because there were believers who did become sick and who did die and some were healed. They were experiencing life. You know, my rule of thumb for the, the teaching, I don't want to get on a rabbit trail here, when people are teaching positive confession and, and you just have to close your eyes and believe it and uh, it'll happen and all of that, is like, take that, get on a plane and go to Mathari Valley in Kenya, one of the world's largest slums, and tell them that. And yet I've met people in Mathari Valley who had a greater peace than most believers I see in America. Amen. So if it will preach in Mathari, it should preach here. Amen. You can't go there and do that. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting off on a rabbit trail. My point is, these believers, they weren't the middle class. They weren't the upper middle class. They were really going through a trial. Because believers do go through trials. Somebody said, in the world, you will have tribulation. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Amen. Praise his name. Amen. So let's break down what, what James is saying here. He says, count it all joy. The word count from the Greek word, uh, hegeomai, and it means to lead. It's interesting. It means to lead, to go before, to go before. Interesting. Count it all, it all, or the word all, or it all. That, that is the entire experience, it, meaning the, the, the whole experience Every form of declension, a condition of decline, which is is what declension is, a condition of decline or deterioration. What is that? What is that? Let's put those together. Count it all. Count it all. 
even those times when I feel like my life has fallen apart. Every form of declension. Every form of deterioration. Every, even the times when I've failed or I've been a, I feel like a failure. That God is there with me. Count it all, he says, joy. Why should we count it joy? Well, we go to the Greek word for joy. And this is a word, chara. And it means cause or occasion of joy. Hmm. It means of persons who are one's joy. It means literally calm delight. Who do we have calm delight in? It's Jesus. So James could be saying here, and that could be saying, he is saying here, count it all. Everything you're going through, count it all. Jesus. Did you get that? Count it all joy because our focus should remain on Jesus. As we go through trials, let the calm, here listen to this, let the calm delight of the Lord, your focus on the Lord, lead you. Let it lead you. When you're going through a difficult time, if you do not allow, I'm talking to believers, do not allow the calm delight of God's presence to lead you, you are assured that doubt, fear, and unbelief will lead you. And we go, going through a trial like that, it's, we're gonna have, it's going to be very difficult. And one uh, commentator commenting on what James says here, he says, count it all joy. He said, regard it, that is the trial, as a thing to rejoice in, a matter which should afford you happiness. You are not to consider it as a punishment, a curse, or as a calamity, but as a fit subject of felicitation. Long word which simply means love. In other words, God allows the t- trials to come because he loves you. Oh, that blows a lot of people away. God exists for my happiness. He wants everything to be easy for me. For my ease and my comfort, that's why he exists now. He exists that we might know him, but he works in our lives for his glory. And he allows trials to come to teach us different things, as we will see as we get further into the word here. And he does it because he loves us. To count it all joy is to believe that God still loves me even though I'm going through a trial. i put it that way. To count it all joy is to believe that God still loves me even though I may be going through a trial. And so to count it all joy, what James is speaking about here, is an attitude of faith. It requires faith to say, you know, I'm going to count it joy. I'm not rejoicing in the thing that happened, but in the midst of what I'm going through, I'm going to count it all joy. All divine joy. Because God is with me in the midst of whatever I'm going through. Now, Jesus Christ, our example. Remember, the Bible says the Lord is our example for suffering. That when he stood before Pontius Pilate, he stood as a lamb for those who would slaughter him. A lamb for, before those who would slaughter him. And he, he spoke not a word. He was, he was silent. And, and we, he is our example when we go through trials, when we're suffering. And we find that example in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, where it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising his shame. Amen. For Who for the what set before him? Joy set before him. He endured the cross, despising his shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look at that example. How did he get through the cross? in the shame of it, by focusing on the joy. How are we to get through our trials? By focusing on the joy. And who was the joy for us? Jesus. Amen? That's our example. Are you following me? Because if you don't need to, oh, I didn't need that message today, Pastor. Oh, you will. <laughs> Amen. You will. So remember these things. We can have joy in every trial knowing that Jesus is the cause and occasion for our joy. That he is sovereign over whatever I am going through. I've often said he is over whatever we are under. 
but you've got to fix on, have your eye fixed on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, so that we can count what we're going through as Jesus going through it with us. He's our joy. The second uh, step, if you will, is uh, to overcoming trials is, is realizing that God gives tests. God's, that a trial is God's test. Amen. In and, and verse 3, it says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Hmm. Oh, we want to be believers. We want to follow Jesus, but we don't want no test. But authenticity is impossible apart from testing. I'll say it again. Authenticity is impossible apart from testing. Whether it's your car or your furniture, your clothing, what have you, your relationships, even your marriage, it will all be tested to reveal the authenticity and the value of it. You know, you've been married for a long time, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. God builds into that relationship a value that you can't find anywhere else. A value that cannot be replaced by a one-night stand. You have a value there that's rich. What my wife and I have, after 47 years of marriage, it, there's a value and a richness there. We're not perfect, but you know what? There's something that God has given us that the world can't take away. And sometimes we're in a restaurant. I remember years ago, me in Hawaii, and somebody came, and the girl was, we're telling her, told her we were there celebrating our anniversary. And I don't know, it's probably 30 years back then or whatever, but not, you know, a long time ago. But uh, she said, what's your secret? People ask us, you know, if you stay married long enough, you'll be a witness for Jesus. Amen. <laughs> and what's your secret? And we look at each other, and we know it ain't us. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and we get to say, Jesus. Because it is Jesus. But this marriage has been tested, and every marriage will be tested. You know, I kind of chuckle when I, I run into newlyweds. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't know, do you? <laughs> Everything you said before that preacher will be tested. It will be tested, but to prove that it is of value. Amen? God gives what I call, he believes in, pop quizzes. <laughs> Remember pop quizzes in church? I mean, in church. <laughs> in church, yeah. Sometimes you get those in church. Pop quiz in school. Amen. You're sitting there in school. The teacher told you the day before, make sure you read chapter 2 and 3 or whatever, and, and you show up, you haven't read anything. And we're going to have a pop quiz. Uh, the collective groan of the classroom. Uh, except for that one person that sits up front and says on the honor roll, yay! <laughs> Just want to go up and choke them, you know. <laughs> They did their homework. And so, you know, but God believes in pop quizzes. And, and we thought, how can this teacher be fair? How can he dare give us a pop quiz? And sometimes we do that with God. How can God dare test me now? Rejoice when you fall into various trials. Fall into it. it, it, it you, weren't, you didn't have it on your calendar. You were going along and you just fell into it unexpectedly is the way God many times will test us when we're not ready for it. God, I, I, give me a test, but let me study up, and if you can come back next Monday, I'll be ready. You know, it's not the way it happens in our life, does it? And when it happens, he says, count it. Count it all joy. And he says, when it happens, remember, God has given you a test. His test have little to do with head knowledge and everything to do with your heart. The trial that we go through has everything to do with your heart. It's not the head knowledge. Oh, I learned some things. Eh, that's great. But what God is looking at is your heart. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 17, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. Because when we look at ourselves, we test ourselves. We look great. But David knew better than that. He said, Let's search me, O oh God. See if there be any wicked way in me. Try me, Lord. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in a way that's everlasting. And we stand in the mirror and go, I look great. We examine ourselves. We look great. But God always looks at the heart and says, eh, we need to take a little edge off here. And we wonder, I've been doing everything. been going great. And now this trial. You know, God hates me. No, he loves you. 
but he's looking at your heart. God tests the hearts. An untested believer is an inauthentic believer. Your testimony is wax. It's not real. It's kind of like that wax fruit your mom used to put on the table for those of us in the baby boomer generation. Remember? It looks so good. You bite into it, it's wax. That's an inauthentic believer. Your faith is wax. It melts in the face of a hot trial. You don't stand long. So God tests us to prove that we are genuine. He sends the test that he might strengthen us, as we'll see here. I was reading the other day about micro tears. What are micro tears? Micro tears is, is something that happens when we exercise. Uh, it's described in this article I was reading, described as uh, those uh, injuries uh, that, uh, to the uh, muscle fibers uh, that help athletes build Mass. So you've got to tear down the muscle in order to build the muscle up. And they have these microfibers, you know. And some of us have these, you know, New Year's resolutions that we're going to work out every day, you know. And, uh, you know, I've been working out. It's been like three weeks now, so I'm about ready to give up. But, <laughs> you know, you, it's, but we make those resolutions. Well, it, it doesn't feel good, you know, because your muscles are tearing down. The microfiber tears but it has to be torn down so that it can be built up. Or are you with me? Amen. In this particular article, this one doctor described micro, tear, micro tears this way. He says, uh, once these micro tears occur, the body sends good nutrition and good blood to the area to heal. This is... In turn, this in turn is how you grow muscular, musculature, which is we grow muscles. So true. And I thought spiritually this really applies. Trials are like micro tears. God testing us. And yet God provides for us in the midst of that test. As we exercise our faith in the trial, he provides for us nutrition. He doesn't leave us. And he allows good blood to flow to the area so that we might experience renewal, restoration, and healing. Amen? Think about that. He allows the trials so that he might build us up, not tear us down, not destroy us. I know there's times in my life where I've actually said to the Lord, I prayed this prayer. Here, here's my prayer. I mean, I say things to God. <laughs> Some of the things, praise God, you don't, you'll never know. But, uh, but this time, I remember one time praying to the Lord, because this is why one trial after another after another just seemed like, I said, God, what are you trying to do, kill me? Anybody ever feel that way? I said, Lord, just, just take me home. I mean, you don't have to do all this, all this drama. Just call me home, you know. <laughs> Amen. Ever feel that way sometimes? Like, Lord, what are you trying to do, kill me? You know what God said to me? Yeah. I'm trying to kill you. You need to decrease so that I can increase. You need to die so you can live. Amen? And we need to. The test sometimes will push you to that point where you go, God, what's going on? He's doing a work in you. He's breaking you down so that he might build you up. Peter says this way, 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now... For a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God's trying to get you to praise, honor, and glory, that he might be glorified through your life when the Lord returns. He's working within us. He's testing us. He not only tests us, but here's the third step in trials. And the reason we can rejoice is not only we know that God is testing me, I can rejoice because God is also perfecting me. He's tested the metal, and now he's perfecting the metal. He's knocking off 
the rough edges, smoothing things down, fashioning it in according to his purpose and his will. He's perfecting us. Why do I say that? Verse 4 says, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Let patience have its perfect work. The perfect work of patience, what is it? Is the work of character. It's the work of maturity within the life of the believer. And it takes patience. Let, that means permission, allow patience. Through patience, the perfect work of God in your life. What does it mean? Waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. It requires a faith that is deliberate. I'm going to trust you, Lord. I've often said to people, if you fall, fall forward. <laughs> Don't fall back. Or fall forward. Be delivered. Get back up and continue to seek the Lord. Fall forward. Deliberate faith continues to trust in God. It's unwavering faith despite the intensity of the trial. Proverbs chapter 24 says this about those who do not have sort of a deliberate faith. He says, if your faith, if you faint rather in the day of adversity, your strength is small. If you faint in the day of adversity, your faith is small. And I've seen a lot of people kind of faint during COVID and faint, you know, and they're going through a time of adversity. Some have walked away from the church, to be quite honest. And the Bible says if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Not your faith is small, because it only takes a mustard seed of faith to move a mountain. Your strength is small. Why is your strength small? Because your strength is based upon who you are and your ability rather than God. Allowing patience to have its perfect work is waiting upon the Lord to strengthen you. And God will keep us in the day of adversity. And we can stand, not according to our ability, but his power. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen? The Hebrew word for small is interesting. It means narrow and, and tight distress. Hard to stand through a trial when you're full of distress. The only way to get rid of that distress is to walk through that trial in the strength of the Lord. To say, Lord, I'm totally dependent upon you. I'm going to wait on you. Let patience have its perfect work. And again, James tells us why. He says that we might be perfect and complete. Now, James is not speaking about, you know, fleshly perfection, like, oh, I'm a perfect person now. He's not talking about that at all. He's talking about someone whose mind and heart and soul and spirit and, and body is committed and surrendered in, in, in sanctification to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our whole being, Lord, it belongs to you. When you're waiting on the Lord, that's where it brings you. When you're going through a trial and you're waiting on God, you know, you're at the end of yourself. And you're realizing, Lord, everything I have, it belongs to you. I'm totally surrendered to what your will is. Now perfect in me that which you desire. It's the, it's the means by which we attain godly character. Again, what is he perfecting through Patience, the work of patience, and that is godly character. God is changing something within us. Now, when you talk about, you know, the fact that he's perfecting in us and his work within us and that we might be uh, uh, complete, we might be perfect in him. Again, it's not talking about having a perfect walk. And I see that many in Scripture that, you know, these the, the apostles, they didn't have perfect walks. They, times they feared, times they made mistakes and all. And I love what the Scripture says about those of you who may be sitting here or watching online and you're thinking, I've got to be perfect. No, no, no. God's working in you that he might perfect in you, that he might complete that work in you. He who began a good work in you, the Bible says, will also complete it. But as we're walking in the Lord, none of us are perfect in the fleshly sense in fact, the Bible says here in Proverbs 24, it says, For a righteous man may fall seven times. Remember I said fall forward, amen, and rise again. But the wicked shall fall by calamity. 
Sometimes we do fall, but fall in the right direction toward the cross, toward Jesus. Amen. And then Paul declared he went through a lot of trials. It's recorded for us in Scripture. And in one place in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he said, we are hard pressed on every side. That's a trial, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, don't understand what's going on, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. That's faith. Did Paul have a perfect walk? No, there was a time he wanted to quit and Jesus had to show up. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. But it does mean that he, so he was surrendered, his whole body, his whole being, to the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, that he might be com- perfect and complete in the Lord. Perfectly and completely trusting in God. Trials are a struggle. As we find ourselves in that struggle, we feel like we're in the oven of God's affliction. You know, God has an oven of affliction, if you will. And the Bible says he tries the hearts. Some people may argue and say, well, no, I don't think God afflicts us, but he allows us to be afflicted. Many times we'll afflict us, and David had testified, David, King David testified to that in, in Psalm 119 when he said, it is good, that, good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Wow. How do we learn God's word? How do we learn, stand firm upon his word? How do we really learn? It's through affliction. We can learn things. We come to church and hear things. Go, oh, that was good. That was a good point. I'm going to write that down. Then God said, okay, that's good. You wrote it down, but let's walk it out. And then, then, of course, we postpone that. We we procrastinate. I'll walk it out tomorrow. I'll walk it out next week. Six months go by. I'll walk it out. (laughs) We never do. And God sends affliction along to kind of speed up the process <laughs> and burns within our minds his truth, whereby it's no longer in my mind, it's now in my heart. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The things that I've learned in the Lord, the things that I, people go, why does he speak with so much conviction? I walk through it. I'm not telling you something I got by attaining a degree or something. I'm telling you something, I lived. And many times through affliction because I'm a hard head. Amen. It's the truth. David says, it's good. David, the man after God's own heart, he says, it's good that I've been afflicted that I might learn to keep your word, your statutes. And so it is with us. And so God sends those trials so that his word is not just information, but it's transformation within our lives, when our whole being is surrendered to him. The devil wants us to think that, you know, as a believer, that everything should be comfort and ease. If God really loves us, he would make things easy for us all the time. But God allows the hard things out of his love for us that we may grow and have a deeper relationship with the Lord. And The devil wants us to think there's nothing worthy in going through a trial, but James says here that, you know, you go through these trials that you might be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, what does it mean, lacking nothing, there in the latter part of verse 4? Paul writes these words to a young preacher by the name of Timothy, and he says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain, my friend, we can carry nothing out. So true, never seen a U-Haul in a funeral procession. (laughs) Godliness with contentment is great gain. When our whole being is surrendered to the Lord, I'm telling you, there's something I've experienced. This is something I've walked through in my life, and I'm sure we'll walk through it again at some point, because trials don't end at a certain age. Amen. <laughs> but it was time in my life when I was going through a tremendous struggle, a tremendous t- trial. I, I just no way I knew I could do it in my own strength. I needed the Lord. And I watched as I surrendered my whole being to God. I said, God, I got nothing. I watched the Holy Spirit envelop me. I can't describe it in any other way but a bubble. It's like a boy in a bubble, you know. Envelop me in the presence of God where I experienced a supernatural joy and peace that surpasses human understanding. I'm telling you what I know. 
And I watched God do that in my life. And, but it, it, it happened. It didn't start out that way because first I went the rebellious route. Then I just, my hands to my side, God, I can't do this. And coming back and surrendering to the Lord oh, completely, he overshadowed my life with his presence, with a godly contentment. What that means, it doesn't mean that I'm content because I got a raise or a new house, a new car, you know, none of that. Godly contentment. He says it's great gain. Great gain for us because it satisfies us whereby you have want for nothing. Again, I didn't have a bunch of stuff. I just had the Lord. And if somebody said, what do you need? I said, nothing. I haven't want for nothing. He says, you will lack nothing. And then what does David tell us in Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not lack for anything when the Lord is my shepherd. Amen? And this is, oh, give him praise and glory. Amen? Somebody ought to be thanking God. Because you're sitting here today and you know that you should be in the crazy house but for the grace of God. How God has carried you. You have a peace that only can come from him. That surpasses human reasoning and understanding. Amen? That's the peace of God. That's the godly contentment by which James said you will lack nothing. Amen? Oh, that's the peace of God. Thank God he meets us in the midst of the trials. You know, in all of this, because of us waiting upon the Lord, his perfecting within our lives, allowing patience, not storming out the room, but being quiet, shutting your mouth. Amen. I'm always praying, Lord, put a watch by my mouth. because My mouth wants a jailbreak. Amen. <laughs> put a guard by my mouth. Amen. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Amen. But I understand sometimes I need to be quiet. Even though I have the answer, God says, don't say anything. It's hard to do, but let patience have its perfect work within you. Amen. Because if we don't, <laughs> we'll have a half-baked faith. In Hosea, Hosea, the Old Testament the book, one of the minor prophets, Hosea chapter 7, verse 8. You don't have to turn there, but here, here's what God says about the nation of Israel in Hosea chapter 7, verse 8. He says, Israel, or Ephraim, he refers to Israel as Ephraim, is like a cake unturned. I don't know much about baking, but an unturned cake is a half-baked cake. Amen. And when we're unwilling to wait upon God. When God is still working on us, we jump off the workbench. Say, God, I think that's enough. I, I, I pretty, feel pretty good right now. And we don't wait upon the Lord. We're going to end up with a half-baked faith. Because we're not allowing patience to have its perfect work within us through that trial. God is trying to get something into you. While we're always trying to get out of something out of a trial, but be patient because the Lord desires to bake, to perfect within you the sweet aroma of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now lastly, let me just say the uh, next step, if you will, to rejoice in a trial is to also walk in wisdom. And James talks about that here in Verses 5 to 8, where he says, if any of you uh, lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives you all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Verse 7, for let not that person, that man, Suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Amen. There's no way we can go through a trial without God's wisdom, standing upon God's word. And, of course, wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. 
The Bible says in Psalm 111, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Good understand- I need good understanding when I'm going through a trial. Because here's what happens in a trial. Trials have a way of changing your theology. From trusting in God for trusting in yourself. Or trusting in someone else. I watch believers who are going through a trial and we're just going to believe God. And, and you know, next thing you know, they find a loophole in God's word. And you go, oh, you know, all of a sudden the theology has changed, you know. Or they go in search of a teacher or a preacher who will tell them what they want to hear and scratch their itch. We need God's wisdom. Don't change your theology. Trust in God's word and what he has said in his guidance. I need the word of God, the wisdom of God as I go through a trial. If you ask God for wisdom, he will give it to you. The Bible says liberally. Without measure. God, what should I do in this situation? What does your word say? He'll tell you. You know, sometimes we don't ask God what he wants or what he wants us to do uh, by virtue of the fact that we know what the answer is and we don't want to hear it. Sometimes we do that with the Lord. But he said he would apply it to us liberally. There are many people who say they want God's wisdom. They'll make an appointment for counseling and all, and they'll hear the wisdom and the counsel of God, but they will never apply it. And the Bible says, it speaks about this in Proverbs 17. It says, why is there in the hand of a fool the purchase price of wisdom since he has no heart for it? Wow. You've got the purchase price for wisdom, but you never buy wisdom. You never apply wisdom in your life. So why is the purchase price for wisdom in the hands of a fool? They have no hunger, no desire for it. So people come in, I want counsel from the pastor. You know, I'm thinking about moving in with this guy. He's not a Christian, but I think I can kind of evangelize him. And, you know, I think he's interested in me, but I'm going to sleep downstairs. He's going to sleep upstairs. I'm getting too personal. Let me move on. And, uh, you know, and so what, what do you think the Word of God says? Well, the Word of God says do not allow your good to be evil spoken of. Do not even entertain the appearance of evil, you know, to honor God. And people will hear that and they will go, oh, but maybe I can get them saved. That's why God wants them to move in with me. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Say we want wisdom, but then when it's given to us, we don't apply it. Amen. Not picking on you. I'm just saying that's just one example. There are many where we won't apply the word of God. When the winds of We need God's word because when the winds of feelings and winds of human opinion and winds of circumstances begin to change and to toss us like a wave back and forth, they begin to blow upon us. We need God's word to be an anchor to our soul. And that's what the wisdom of God would do for you when you're going through a trial. It would be an anchor to your soul so that you might your rejoicing again might be in the Lord. Not in your circumstances. His word, his wisdom will sustain us in the midst of a storm every time. And if we do not, then verse 7, James warns us that you will be like a double-minded man, unstable in all of your ways. Unstable. Instability in your walk, up and down and sideways, tossed by the winds that blow. What you hear on the news what you hear about in the opinion of others, what you may think of yourself that's outside of what God says about you. You begin to live your life according to those things, and you have an, a faith that is not stabilized in your double-minded, split personality, you know. In one way at church, praise the Lord, at home, ah, you know, it's like, what's going on? That's a double-minded person. Because you're not applying the wisdom of the Lord. You're not anchored to the word of God. So those four things, we will take heed to them, will enable us to have joy in the midst of our trials. Not here preaching that you're never going to have a trial. It's going to come. Again, we're either coming out of one, we're in the midst of one, or we're going into one. That's just the way life goes. 
So we need to remember these things that James is teaching us. Here's what I want to share with you in conclusion. One thing I have come to understand about trials is that trials never take place in a vacuum. Never take place in a vacuum. When you go through a trial, that it not only affects your life, but it also affects the lives of other people around you. We think we're going through a trial that it's all about us and nobody's watching, but people are watching you. In fact, when you think about it, those who've gone before us, they have endured unimaginable trials. When I say those who've gone before us, our ancestors, regardless of what your background is, you know, your ethnicity is, it doesn't matter. There are people who've gone on before you, who have gone before us, who have uh, endured tremendous trials so that for our sake. Amen. Now think about my ancestors, the trials that they went through. I'm standing on their shoulders. You're all, everybody in here, you're standing on the shoulders of somebody. Men and women who gave their lives for our country, the freedoms we have, we're standing on someone's shoulders because of the trials that they went through. God has ordained certain things for us in the trials that we may be facing, things that he wants to accomplish. He has in mind people that we haven't even been born yet that will stand on our shoulders. The church ought to be thinking about that today. And here's a question for us as individuals. Who will stand on your shoulders? Will your children be able to stand on your shoulders? Will they look back at your life after you're gone and say, you know, Grandpa wasn't perfect, but he prayed. He loved the Lord. Grandma wasn't perfect, but she was always in the Word, standing upon the promises of God. Whose shoulders will they stand on in your life? Damar Hamlin, you know Damar Hamlin, you've heard his name a lot in the news lately. He's a 24-year-old defensive back from the Buffalo Bills who collapsed on the football field, I think it was last Monday night, the football game. And I read somewhere where it says that he was a devout Christian. I've never met him. I don't know, but that's what I read. And no sane person, as I thought about what happened to him, just like the Lord says, give thanks in all things, not for all things. No sane person would wish what happened to him, to to DeMar Hamlin, on on anybody. And we thank God. Amen. Praise the Lord. The good news is that he's, he's recovering. Amen. We thank the Lord for that. Praise the Lord. The power of prayer. But when I consider, you know, what took place on that Monday night and throughout the week as a result of uh, this young man's devastating trial, I can't help but be amazed by the power of our God. You think about that. I don't know if you've given it any thought, but, you know, think about it. Nobody but God could stop a Monday night football game, amen, in its tracks. Nobody but God. And we, we love our football. Stop the game in its tracks. Amen. And nobody but God could bring a, a rowdy crowd of over 70,000 people to a whisper. Nobody but God. And nobody but God could call a prayer meeting on ESPN. Amen. Nobody but God. Oh, you ought to give him praise and glory. That's what our God did. I mean... <laughs> this is the rest of the story. I thought ESPN and acrostic ought to be eternal savior present now. Amen. A prayer meeting. Right there on ESPN. The anchor said, I don't know if I should do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. (laughs) Ain't nobody but God. In light of this young man's injuries also, (laughs) the charity. Remember the charity was raising $2,500, trying to raise $2,500 to buy some toys for underprivileged kids. That charity at this time is probably over $8 million. $8 $8 million have come in. You see, our God is a God of above and beyond. You're going through the trial and you're focused on your own comfort at ease when God's using it as a ripple effect to touch dozens, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of lives. We never know the full extent of how God will use a trial, the trial that we're facing. But we can be assured of this It's never just about you. Another young man collapsed on a football field 18 years ago. He almost died. 
after multiple operations, surgeries. God raised him up by his power. And now that young man is poised to be, after I resign, the next senior pastor of Calvary Worship Center. That's Pastor Nathan Pittman, my wife and I, our son. And at the time he was going through that, we wondered, why this trial, Lord? What are you doing? God was doing something in his heart that we could not see. We thank God for his faithfulness. James says, count it all joy. Why? Because it's all under Jesus. It's about his glory. It's about his kingdom, his purpose. Let me leave you with a glorious perspective from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 regarding trials. And Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at, those, at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal.